Chapter two, colliding cultures. By 1600, the government of Spain had colonized much of South and Central America. An envious England soon sought to tap into the enormous wealth that Spain had brought to light. The Protestant Reformation had shaken England, but Queen Elizabeth I oversaw England's so-called golden age, which included both the expansion of trade and their exploration and the literary achievements of William Shakespeare. English mercantilism, state-sponsored manufacturing and trading system of economics, provided a steady supply of consumers and laborers, stimulated economic expansion, and it funneled wealth into the island nation. In fact, that was the idea. Reports of brutal Spanish atrocities, the so-called Black Legend, spread throughout Europe and provided a humanitarian justification for English colonization. That black legend drew on religious differences and political rivalries. English writers argue that Spanish barbarities were foiling a tremendous opportunity for the expansion of Christianity across the globe and that a benevolent conquest of the new world by non-Spanish monarchies offered the surest salvation of the new world's pagan masses. With these religious justifications, and with obvious economic motives, Spain's rivals began to plot their advances toward New World shores. The most successful early ventures into the New World were a form of state-sponsored piracy known as privateering. Queen Elizabeth sponsored sailors or sea dogs like John Hawkins and Francis Drake to plunder Spanish ships and towns in the Americas. These privateers, they weren't directly you know, sponsored by the government. They earned a substantial profit both for themselves and for the English crown. England practiced piracy on a scale, one historian wrote, quote, that transformed crime into politics. Harassment by these privateers served as a way to begin to soften the Spanish advantage in the, in the new world, but it brought on direct warfare between the Spanish and the British empires. During a critical sea battle in that ensuing war, a freak storm literally brought down the entire Spanish armada. The destruction of those ships changed the course of world history overnight. It not only saved England and secured English Protestantism, but it also opened the seas to English expansion and paved the way for England's colonial future. By 1600, England stood ready to embark on its dominance over North America. Early English expeditions were privately backed undertakings by English trading companies given official permission by the royal monarchy. As such, English colonization happened in fits and starts. In 1587, with a predominantly male cohort of 150 colonists, John White uh, reestablished a settlement on North Carolina's Roanoke Island. Supply shortages prompted White to return to England for additional support. That's a theme we're going to see over these decades. But the Spanish Armada and the mobilization of British naval efforts I just talked about stranded him in Britain for several years. When he finally returned to the island, he found the colony abandoned. What happened to this failed colony? White found the word Croatoan, something like this, carved into a post in the abandoned colony. Historians presume the colonists, short of food, may have fled for a nearby island of that name and encountered its settled native population. Others offer violence with natives as an explanation or even a colony-wide adoption into native society. Regardless, the English colonists were never heard from again. When Queen Elizabeth died in 1603, no Englishman had yet established a permanent colony in the New World. It was understood as an unforgiving place. At the first successful colony, Jamestown, now in present day Virginia, the first colonists nearly died out from malaria and the harsh winters. This is the first successful colony. Only a second expedition of supplies kept that colony alive. The Virginia Company brought another 600 people to Jamestown before the starving time when natives clear-cut forests and forced the colonists to su survive on dogs, rats, and leather. These people took the journey for stock in the company, and some were poor people, indentured servants, who had agreed to work for the company in the New World for a period of seven years as a form of compensation for passage to the New World. Relief expeditions from England and the discovery of tobacco as an export product kept that colony afloat. The noxious weed tobacco soon drove colonists southward for more land and better soil to grow it. The implementation of a headright system 
prompted larger English families to move to the New World together. They were promised 50 acres per head. Establishing the first American plantations and promising economic opportunity for families brave enough to leave Europe behind. The right to the use of land did not generally imply the right of its permanent possession among Native Americans, which foreshadowed perpetual conflicts over land ownership to follow. The English were slow to adapt to life on the continent and relied on imported goods from England for many, many years. The early English colonies were transplanted societies. They walled themselves off from Indians, and they were feeble attempts to create England on the American continent. America, though, was destined to be a middle ground of cultural exchange and conflict with Native Americans. We'll come back to that. In the end, 80% of the 8,500 plus white English settlers died within 17 years of landing at Jamestown. That's four and five. Colonization was always a risky proposition and success was never assured for England. English settlers survived only when they began to adopt native lifestyles and practices, specifically in terms of agriculture. The first settlers from England were not farmers, but in order to have enough food to survive each winter, many had to adopt the popular crop rotation siblings of corn, beans, and squash, which provided sufficient calories to hold native societies without the need of plows. The American canoe, which is perfectly suited to the narrow inland waterways of the Americas, serves as a lasting example of colonists' adoption of uncivilized native practices for the means of survival on this new American continent. Beyond Jamestown, the colony of Maryland began as a refuge for English Catholics, though Protestants were invited along to make the expedition profitable. The 1649 Act Concerning Religion decreed religious freedom in the colony and pointed to a tolerant future, perhaps in the Americas. The Pilgrims, as celebrated every Thanksgiving, were Puritan separatists that landed at Plymouth Rock in December of 1620. They were forced to rely on Indians that first winter and are one of the few examples of the English colonists cooperating eagerly with natives. That band of Indians that they, had, uh, that they ate with died out due to smallpox 13 years later, and the pilgrims generally remained a poor religious minority. Events in England continued to encourage Puritans to migrate to the Americas. Merchants too migrated. The Massachusetts Bay Company left for the New World to create an economic entity that supported Puritan goals. Whole families moved, which allowed the colonies in Boston and the surrounding areas to flourish. The New England Puritans set out to build their utopia by creating planned communities of the godly. While not democratic by today's standards, all male property owners could vote in town meetings and choose their selectmen, their assessors, their constables, and other officials from among themselves to conduct the daily affairs of local government. Upon their founding, towns wrote covenants reflecting the Puritan belief in God's covenant with his people. Towns sought to arbitrate disputes and contain strife, as did the church. Wayward or divergent individuals were persuaded, corrected, or coerced. Sometimes exaggerated popular conceptions of Puritans as hardened author authoritarians are, are just that, exaggerated. Other er early colonies expanded for three reasons, for better soil, for religious freedom, and for free land. Connecticut was settled much like Massachusetts. Rhode Island and the Providence plantations became a haven for religious freedom, founded by a uh, radical Massachusetts minister, Roger William. Similarly, Anne Hutchinson's challenge to the Massachusetts hierarchy led to the settlement of Maine and New Hampshire. 30 years after Maryland was chartered, and after the English Civil War had ended with the Restoration, Carolina, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania were authorized by a tax-hungry King Charles II in England. Carolina was divided. Slavers from Barbados moved into the South, and the North was dominated by backwoods farmers. Organized into counties, its North-South politics foreshadowed the system of American politics set to emerge after the Revolution. New York and New Jersey were contested colonies uniquely diverse in their population. Pennsylvania was born out of a Quaker's desire to practice pacifism and to pursue religious salvation freely. It was a well-organized colony that flourished without conflict with native peoples. It's important that we remember that half of English settlers landed on the North American seaboard. 
The other half landed in Bermuda, Jamaica, and on other Caribbean islands alongside the Spanish colonies of Cuba and Puerto Rico. The fledgling English settlements on the East Coast that we were just discussing paled in importance when compared to these colonies in the Caribbean. Those colonies created a critical foothold for Britain towards the vast North American continent. The Caribbean West Indies presented perfect conditions for the planting of sugarcane. There we are. Natives to these islands were wiped out by disease and violence early, and the land was refashioned by Europeans. Growing sugarcane is labor intensive and soon required, they believe, the use of slave labor when white indentured servants refused to do the backbreaking work. Soon more than three times as many slaves populated the tropical island as whites. English colonists looking for slave labor in the Chesapeake I'll refer to that in a bit. Those are the southern colonies. Soon, toward to, uh, soon turned toward the burgeoning slave trade to the Caribbean, accelerating the rate at which West African slaves were funneled to the region. Enslaved Africans transported across the Atlantic Ocean would further complicate the collision of cultures in the Americas. The creation and maintenance of a slave system would spark new understandings of human difference and new modes of social control. In the American Southwest borderlands, this is Texas, Florida, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Spanish colonists converted natives to Catholicism and put them to work, building agricultural systems of organization and constructing forts to defend against new English colonial ambitions. The Southeast borderlands of North Florida and Georgia, the last English colony, Georgia, existed as places of tension between the Spanish and the English. The Spanish still held on to Florida tenuously, alongside the native Appalachian people who used the Spanish road, the Camino Real uh, road to trade their agricultural products among the region. 100 years of skirmishes on the continent ended with the Seven Years War, what we now call the French and Indian War generally, which would eventually leave England a dominant colonial power in North America. The struggle for the North American continent was a conflict of European powers propelled by religious differences and for many a fight over power, culture, and global legitimacy. But for many years though, a middle ground between European power and native wildness existed. On the peripheries of these great empires, and despite an English presumption of superiority over natives, whites and Indians were forced to sometimes cooperate on the American continent. This is not to say relationships were necessarily balanced. Indians were often used by whites as forced labor in the earliest days of settlement, just like they had with Spain. The famous Pocahontas, a native from the region of the Jamestown colony, converted to Christianity and traveled to Europe, propelling an interest in civilizing America's natives. And then the enslavement of natives in the New World eventually become taboo among the English. Europeans were both menacing and appealing to natives. Without a conception of a nation, natives look to whites for kinship and leadership. The French of the Great Lakes region best cooperated with natives in the end and created peaceful terms of coexistence that lasted decades. Make no mistake, relationships between the whites and natives were not doomed from the start. Cowboys versus Indians was not inevitable and to most people on both sides, conflict was not the outcome they eventually hoped for. The English colonies, which I have covered very briefly, started all as separate settlements and business projects, but quickly coalesced into somewhat a politically unified effort at empire. Though they had arrived in separate places for different reasons, a shared English colonial identity gradually grew among the colonists, and only then did the colonies begin to even faintly think of themselves as a collective entity distinct from the peoples of the British homeland that took decades to, to build. American colonies finally uh, came into their own at the end of the 17th century. The South, what I call the Chesapeake throughout these lectures, was increasingly focused on growing tobacco and cotton with African slaves, while free labor, mercantilism, and religion dominated the culture of the North, the area I called in general New England. New York, Boston, and Charleston emerged as centers of trade, both import and export with England in these years. As the 17th century ended, the rest of the continent remained sparsely populated by Indians, French, and Spanish, who dominated the landmass and lived in relative coexistence and loose cooperation. Changes underway all across the British Empire, though, foreshadowed greater territorial ambitions and in an interconnected Atlantic economy. The English were not finished with the North American continent. 